Hello, everybody. And uh, this is uh, the drolling dinghy, which uh, you saw on your flyers, uh, which we built in the in the Boat Building Academy in, in Lyme Regis. And half of it is basically about, about our experience building her in the Boat Building Academy, and the other half is, is about the build, build itself, I suppose. So you know the origin of, of the uh, drolling name, uh, the wren, the little bird, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the um, <coughs> the proposed format I, I have tonight. Uh, reasons for my choice of the boat building course is simple enough. Uh, one, I have uh, done a couple of. I have attempted to do a couple of wooden boat building courses. I I grew up around boats all my life, uh, uh, on an island off the west coast and wanted to build one for years and years. Uh, so I, I eventually um, went to England uh, to look at Lowestoft and, and Lyme Regis, and I did a short course in Lyme Regis. <coughs> I was kind of converted after that. Uh, the Boat Building Academy itself is, is a rather large building in, in Lyme Regis, a very old building that's been around for, for a long time, but um, they do quality work there and uh, this is the morning of the launch and this is is a, a, a it was referred to already um, uh, George O'Brien Kennedy designed this particular boat here I'll, I'll come back to her again in a minute uh, she's the Yachting World Day boat uh, and that was the morning of, of the launch uh, the Boat Building Academy LRMC means Lyme Regis Marine Centre but they're normally uh, referred to as the Boat Building Academy uh, the 40 week course which we did was very extensive and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, subjects and areas are covered um, very early on the boats to be built are chosen i suppose that 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 was the clincher really when i said about looking at at boat building schools uh, that you could build your own boat uh, they wouldn't guarantee it because they can't you know there's 18 on a course and they can't build 18 boats they don't have the space nor would you have the hours or the, or, or, or the time to do it. Uh, so 11 of us wanted to build and six of us got to build. So that's, uh, and after three weeks, uh, uh, they told us that so that you could be preparing uh, practically and in your mind as well and making decisions, which I have down further uh, about the choice of timber, um, um, you know, ordering, um, uh, uh, materials in time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we, you are given the choice of doing City and Guilds level three exams as well, which consist of practical and written. And um, the, the two practicals, one is a STEM assignment where you have to actually uh, uh, make a STEM from, from a lofting um, um, pattern which they give you. And the other is a fiber reinforced plastic boat, a small model boat. And then there are practical, uh, those are the practicals. If you don't pass them, really, there's not much point in you sitting the written ones, but most people do pass them. And then for the second half, more or less the second half, uh, you have 22 and a half weeks. Uh, but it was interrupted by COVID this year for a few months. So hence, if you looked at the date in the beginning, the, the, we, we actually took longer than a year to complete the course. So we were the COVID-19 course. Uh, these are most of, of the people that uh, did our course. Uh, on the extreme left there is in the sunglasses uh, is, is one of our tutors, Joe <coughs> Blaithwaite. And in the check shirt, uh, trying to organize us for a photograph is, is Will Reed, the principal. In the background, you see the cob uh, and uh, uh, French lieutenant's woman was... was, was um, film just on the end of that and um, um, you're looking eastwards towards um, uh, Portland Bill there and uh, the uh, Boat Building Academy is to the left of, of Joe as you're looking at the screen there Joe in the in the um, dark glasses there was 18 in total some weren't able to come back after the COVID break for various reasons uh, so most turned up on the day of uh, that that picture was taken because that was the final day, uh, but there's one or two missing. Uh, two ladies as well in our course for, for uh, uh, the ladies, uh, nearly every course has at least uh, a, a couple of women or maybe, maybe more, 
but uh, they would be in the minority. And fair play to them. It's 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 uh, uh, they are uh, the two ladies on our course were very capable, uh, and uh, on the previous course, two of of the women on the course actually built boats themselves. So our first boats then were basically we were in, introduced uh, uh, quite early on to stitch and tape or stitch and glue. Uh, we did uh, three boats in five days. Now we were working with with six in each group and we stitched the hulls together. Uh, there was a debate about whether you should use wire or, or cable ties and we stuck with the wire. It, it, uh, it's a uh, 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 holds the panels together a little bit tighter and uh, it's a bit easier to get out, particularly when we're using um, epoxy, which we did. Uh, so we spent time taping, scribing, beveling, making knees. We had an internal fit out uh, and uh, we fitted most of, we didn't get everything quite finished, <coughs> was bilge runners, Rolex wells, and then we sheathed one of the boats in uh, at the end of the week, uh, fully with um, shop strand mat and et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a picture of them here. Uh, there's two of the three boats. Um, I think that's Ian on the left who built his own boat, a West White Scow. And this is Miriam who unfortunately had to leave us. She did work on Drolene for a while, but uh, couldn't come back after the COVID uh, interruption in March. Um, the boats built on our course were a 17 foot shearwater uh, kayak, a paddleboard, yachting board, day boat, Nancy's China, and um, West White Scow, Flying 10, the Drolene, Allure in brackets. It's a Francois Vivier, a French designer. Uh, she wasn't completed. Again, she was taken home, partially finished uh, after the COVID break. Uh, there was to be a sailing canoe. Uh, we did make the sail and we did make, well, we didn't make the moles. Uh, the moles were made by CNC <coughs> Cutter over in Hoop Park, which is a very interesting place, which I'm not really going to have time to talk about, but a terribly interesting place in its own right. Here they are. Uh, this is your, um, this is Charlie in his, um, uh, in his kayak with, um, it's got a, a cedar deck uh, and a stitch and glue uh, ply uh, hull. And he launched early because he was finished early and he wanted to test it out. So there is one of our other colleagues, Virgil, help him, helping him to, um, I'm not sure, was he bringing him ashore in that stage or was he launching him? But um, Virgil didn't really have to get in the water, but he, he was 22, so he decided to do it, you know. Uh, uh, the paddleboard was made partially at home by Steve because the time wasn't available and he finished it in the Boat Building Academy. Um, the um, next one, this is the one designed uh, Yachting World Day Boat uh, by George O'Brien Kennedy and um, Mrs. P. And uh, she's uh, I have a good bit of information on her because of the connection, uh, because uh, George O'Brien Kennedy also redrafted drawing plans in 1996. And uh, this boat, though, is, is um, um, marine ply uh, clinker planking, um, 22, 22 planks, and... Uh, the timbers and frames were Sapelian oak. The mast was, is 21 foot of spruce, hollowed out internally. I'll kind of come back to this business of hollowing out her sail number, which she hadn't got at that stage was 780. And she had to be measured because she is still an active class boat. Uh, you know, several hundred of them have been built, I think three of them at the Boat Building Academy. Uh, so um, uh, 14 foot overall, five foot eight, in with Graham very kindly estimated his hours and the cost, uh, 3,800, circa 3,800 hours he reckoned, and 13,500 pounds sterling with sales, five horsepower outboard trailer and insurance. Uh, thanks Graham for that information if you're listening uh, or watching. This is another boat built on the course by a, a, our youngest boat builder of all, uh, Drew, he was 17 when he started, 18 when he finished. 
she's Nancy's China and uh, Sam Devlin, uh, a US uh, stitch and tape or stitch and glue builder um, and designer, uh, builds boats up to 50 foot with this method. Um, and uh, she's 15 foot three overall, uh, maximum beam of, of six, in, uh, six foot, sorry. Uh, ballast of 300 pounds of lead, uh, sail area 112 square feet. Um, basically there's only four, four panels, which I don't know if you can see this arrow or not. Uh, it's, uh, which uh, there's one goes along the whole, full length there, then the other up the side here. And uh, we had a tradition at, at the Boat Building Academy that that you uh, produce a cake on the day you finished your planking. So Drew was able to produce his cake very, very early on. Uh, but we did remind him he, he, he basically only had four planks. Well, with a bit of scarfing and so on, because uh, uh, his ply is only was eight foot long. Um, but um, there was a lot of finishing on this boat, a lot of fairing, a lot of extra work to do. Uh, so basically when he had the hull done, I mean, he was, he was basically only a third of the way there. He, he had a lot of work to do, but, but they did it and, and they launched. Um, the, um, this is the West White Scow, very interesting. Uh, little boat as well, designed by um, the, um, Ian's uh, great-grandfather, whom, if Ian is listening, listening, I hope I have the name correct, Theo Osborne Smith in 1924. She's 11 foot three, um, four, foot, uh, four foot eight, I think, uh, if I have that correct, wide, uh, and again, eight planks, per side, 16 in total. Oak timbers, kaya planks, he used kaya, which is a mahogany. Um, uh, Sapili uh, for the hog keel and transom, and his mast were, uh, was made out of spruce masts and spars. Again, circa in or around 300, uh, in or around 3,000 3, hours. Uh, this one is a little bit elongated. I couldn't fit the picture in properly. She's not quite as long as that, but it's the Flying Ten by Offa Fox and uh, uh, a beautiful uh, little boat and a very fast little boat. Um, she, she's overall, she's, I think she's, she's on deck. She's about 14 foot, but uh, she's 10 on the waterline. So they call her the Flying Ten. Um, a beam of 311 and she's coal molded with two layers of mahogany and an outer layer of black walnut. A massive keel, which you can't see very well there because it's still on the trailer uh, of um, um, 90 kg um, metal or iron keel, uh, which could, took a lot of fitting and 10 or 12 bolts. Uh, and uh, it's just hanging off the bottom of her really because she's incredibly light boat with, without that keel. Uh, that's the morning of the launch as well. Uh, some boats from the previous 40 week course, uh, uh, 16 foot glue clinker, two 16 foot, a 17 foot uh, redbird strip plank canoe, 16 foot guard side, eight foot Benford cold molded, a Buddha board and a clinker canoe. Uh, there is the Cobal. She had a little bit of trouble on launch day. We were lucky enough that the other course was there during our time and we were able to, to, um, uh, to be there for their launch day. Uh, Katie built this one uh, and um, designed by her uh, partner who is a naval architect. Um, and in the background, you can see the little Benford tender as well. There's a better picture of it later. Uh, this is the guard side carvel uh, lugger, isn't it? And you have the, uh, the, the canoe there in the picture as well that Alex built. He's now gone on to Southampton to do a three year course in, in, in boat building and design. Um, and this is another guard side clinker, 16 foot. Um, Jonathan who built her is cheating a bit, getting her out of the harbor using his outboard. Mm -hmm. And this is the, they said this was the most beautiful boat on the last course, the eight foot uh, tender, uh, 
uh, and uh, he, he finished her really, really well. Uh, there was a little um, clinker canoe that I didn't really have uh, a, a picture in the water of. She's just there as well. And they built her as well on the last course. Uh, the, a lot of this history has been referred to already. Uh, thanks very much to Michael and, and others, but the drolling uh, William Ogle, Ogle V of Bray Sailing Club, 1895-96, plans redrafted by George O'Brien Kennedy, 96. And yeah, you know, uh, Cormac very kindly uh, sent me some stuff as well, where there are two Ogle Vs uh, mentioned, one of them uh, in uh, Spalpeen and one of them in Bolivar, and they came to, I think, at Clontarf Regatta. Uh, built by Foley's Everbring's End for nine pounds, sale um, a little bit extra. Original fleet uh, of eight boats. Uh, disappearance, which Michael has referred to, and I've also uh, read somewhere that uh, there said that some of the fleet died out because some of the owners uh, were involved in the Boer War and didn't return. Now, I don't know how true that is, but uh, that's another. Uh, but um, I think Michael would believe that they were they were destroyed in, in, in a storm. Uh, the Bray Heritage Pro Project, I think uh, um, this has been referred to already. There were five planned and, and two built. Jim Horgan is the guy in Galway, in Furbone Galway, he built a drawly in 2014, and, and he kindly gave me his plans, which he had originally got from, from Bray. Uh, my reasons for choosing, choosing a drawly weren't that sentimental initially, although I've, I've grown to like and love the boat. Uh, they were basically because she was quite small, because I had never built clinker before, and because I knew that uh, they would be more likely to choose a smaller boat because of lack of space in the Boat Building Academy. And um, uh, I, don't have much, I don't have any experience really of, of, of building boats and I've certainly none of, of building a thinker. So the, the Vincent uh, told me about the drawlines and the water wags connections uh, and uh, he, he might want to say something about that. And uh, some of our tutors at the Boat Building Academy uh, claimed that, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, she they copied it from the American cat boats and uh, we had discussions on that as well. Uh, I know Boris uh, Fenema, uh, the Commodore of Bray Sailing Club, uh, has found a Bray Sailing Club Drolling Trophy, which he, he sent me a photograph of. Uh, and um, now I suppose up to now, the, the last one to be built is, 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 the, is the BBA Drolling. Possibly there are four altogether, but maybe I can, uh, you know, people will correct me on that. Four altogether at the present time. Um, these are some of the photos from this, I, I'm not sure where the one on the left, uh, uh, but there it's most definitely a drolling being launched from the beach, and there may possibly be two others there with the very uh, forward uh, mass in them. I think this is Frank's in 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 Bray. Yeah, and, that was in the old jailhouse. Um, yeah, yeah. And then this is Jim Horgan's here in Galway. Uh, that's Jim there in the yellow um, jacket and I think maybe his son. And this is uh, my one in Lyme Regis, which you've seen already. Um, Cormac Loud, uh, expert on, on, on all things maritime, uh, sent me these next slides and Foley's yard right beside the church in Rings End. And Cormac says that Foley's had two slips at the time. They're both visible there in, in the, um, just, just uh, going into the daughter. Um, here's a, what uh, Cormac sent me this one as well with the yard here on the left, just beside the church. And uh, <laughs> several boats moored on, on, on the daughter. Uh, modern day, 
the all those uh, Foley's Yard and all those um, boat clubs along there were made way for these flats. And uh, there is a, the one of the uh, slipways visible still, two rails there visible uh, to this day. Um, thanks to Cormac for all of those. Uh, the Drolene stats, some have been referred to already. She's a very beamy boat, 12, 12 by 6. Uh, our transom, which we think we got right from, from the plans, is 4 foot 8 inches, uh, 22 large planks, 26 oak frames. Uh, we put in extra knees, whether we should have or not, but we felt it did strengthen the boat. And we enlarged the transom knee because we thought it was quite... Um, uh, we didn't think it was, it was quite up to the task of a four foot eight inch transom. Uh, 14 foot mast, although the original plans would have had the mast maybe a little bit smaller than that, 13 foot six. 15 foot boom, 11 foot three inch gaff. She's also designed to carry a, a jib um, slash spinnaker and, and I'm, I'm using the two words because that's what's exactly written in the plans. Uh, we haven't done that, but I do have the um, I do have them as Bruce to to do one, so it would be very interesting. Uh, uh, my instructor Mike Broom uh, did his calculations on CAD, and instead of a hundred square foot of sail, he came up with hundred and twelve square foot. So she's carrying twelve square foot more than the original plans, uh, but then she doesn't have the spinnaker at the moment. Um, we did use Sapili in the keel in the hog and laminated lamination. You know, it, it, it stipulates in the plan a grown stem, but I mean, uh, uh, where do you get that nowadays? So we laminated oak stem in or an outer, and we did Sapili apron, oak transoms, thwarts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the um, so yeah. Uh, and it, I think Michael mentioned earlier about about not you that he did, they did use glue. Well, uh, I'll have to hold up my hands and say that you know uh, we used a lot of glue, yeah. Uh, but between between each plank and on the landings, we didn't obviously use any glue, uh, but we did use butyl rubber, which is uh, great to keep out water, but terrible to use. Uh, but um, uh, there, there are a lot of, 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 of very good glues on, on the go at the moment. Um, interestingly, Graham, who did the Yachting World Day Boat, uh, doesn't have much time for the West System epoxy and used another uh, type. And there are debates about whether epoxy actually glues oak as well as uh, it does other timbers. but. We haven't had any problems with the, you know, so far. Uh, this was the beginning on the bench. Um, stem, um, inner and outer, apron, hog, keel, uh, skeg at the back there, uh, centerboard slots cut, uh, and a lot of glowing and clamping, as clamping was referred to earlier. You need a lot of clamps if you're going to build a boat, yeah, there's no doubt about it. Uh, this is a, a little bit out of out of focus. It's actually too wide. Our transom isn't actually that wide, but um, I, I just couldn't size it properly. Uh, and uh, here's here's a close view of, of the stem, inner and outer, and you can see the, the, the joints there, lip scarf joints, ordinary scarf joints. Uh, this is James Carney, who uh, unfortunately had to leave after the COVID break, but he got, he got a job, so he was happy enough. And uh, James was a little bit annoyed at this stage because he said the other boats were progressing really, really well, uh, but ours just looked like a toothpick. Uh, and uh, it, it did take a while to get it set up, but we eventually got to that stage. Uh, and then we got the moles on, five moles. In the original plans, and, the, and this is the, this is a debate you can always have about about um, boats and plans. In the original plans, there were three moles, and I think yes, 
boat builders of, of the 1890s and early 1900s probably could build that boat with three molds, uh, but we wouldn't have been able to do it. So our instructor, uh, who was a very wise man, in, insisted. We, we, were very, uh, we were very annoyed about it at the time because we thought we, we were finished. And he says, no, no, you need two more molds. And he told us where to put them, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And particularly in, in, the, in the bow, and it's been referred to already, of steaming and bending those planks, I don't think you would have the same boat with three moles as you now have with five. So, yeah, you know, uh, it, 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 these are interesting arguments to have, but uh, we think uh, it, it, we would, certainly wouldn't have been capable of it. I, I, I certainly think some of the boat builders in, in the past you know, and, and, and I know some people from at home when I was growing up could, could build currucks by eye and so on. And, and they generally don't put uh, uh, molds in, into currucks. Uh, but uh, for a boat like this, uh, three molds, I don't think was enough. And um, we put in five anyway, and it worked out a little bit better. There was a lot of steaming. Uh, we, they use a method there where they buy these pla this plastic tubing, uh, you can throw it away afterwards, you tape it, uh, you know, a little bit back from where you want the last bend to be, and uh, we just use wallpaper um, uh, steamers, uh, that's where the pipe is coming from, and leave it in for half an hour or so, and then get it on the boat as fast as you can, uh, and clamp it. Uh, obviously, the stem uh, par uh, part of the planking there wouldn't be shaped until uh, uh, until after uh, you you have it fairly well um, put in um, placed into the st uh, stem rabbit. You can see the garboard plank there, how uh, the twist in it. And Peter Jacobson, who worked with us, is on the other side working. Um, but the two garboards were very very difficult to fit. And we did have cracking, and we did have splits, and we did have issues with with having to um, discard some uh, some planks uh, initially. Uh, the machinist who is uh, worked with us uh, gave us the two best planks that he he said that he could find for the two uh, garboards. Uh, with very few knots and that sort of thing. Larch is lovely, but it can have a lot of knots. And, it, and the whole debate about dead knots and live knots, and do you leave it in it? Do you bore it out? Uh, we did a lot of boring out of knots and a lot of gluing in of plugs and so on as, as well. Um, um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, there you can see with, with two planks on, on this side and the side nearest you, and you see another one ready just on, on top of the on top of the moles there. Um, this is the kind of twist that we had to get in into the planks, the twist and curve, and you can see it here in this plank, which isn't fully finished and is it still isn't ready to go on. So there was a lot, a lot of work, per, particularly in the lower. Um, three to four planks on, on both starboard and, and port sides. Um, the stem then, to fit it to the stem, was the most difficult uh, and took a lot of time and care. Uh, fitting to the transom well, had, had its difficulties, but wasn't, wasn't as difficult. Um, she's uh, about practically finished there. Uh, one plank clamped on the other side with those wooden wooden uh, gripes which they use in uh, the boat building academy and um, you can see the the way the planks are fitted on onto the transom there and um, this is our cleaned out ready for timbers uh, and uh, these are the timbers oak uh, got a couple of coats of uh, primer um, and an extra one on the back because we'd never, never see it again once they went in. And here we, this, we put these in, in, in half a day uh, and we had them steaming in a massive uh, steaming box, which they have there for over an hour, hour and a half. And Joe there with the gray, gray top on is sitting, sitting on the, timbers to make sure they stay down. 
uh, and uh, we insisted he get in the boat because he was the lightest of us. So we didn't want to crack too many of them. We cracked three or four, uh, but most of them, the oak was particularly good and, and it worked very, very well. Uh, on the left in the blue t-shirt is Mike Broom, our um, main instructor and a very wise man. Uh, here's the, the first uh, um, time we've turned her over and of course people are finding fault already. Uh, Steve on the right there is pointing to uh, an issue. Uh, and um, it was mentioned earlier about building, building boats, um, how you build them and so on. Well, you know, we, we built her right way up on a strong back, they call it. And uh, generally, Clinker would be built that way. Uh, we also had the use uh, up here of um, uh, over, um, sorry, I meant to go. I'll just go back for one second. We also had the use up here of an overhead uh, beam, which is in line with, with the keel way, or you can put the two of them in line. And we use that to, to hang um, a plumb bobs off to get, uh, to get stations, all that sort of thing. Uh, and there's a wire there, which you can't actually see, which they use as well. But th that was all set up beforehand. It would take you quite a while to set that up. In, in a workshop. So moving on, uh, moved on quite a bit with, with thwarts, knees, uh, and uh, sole boards, they're ready to go in. Uh, we did have to, because there's so much activity in, in and six boats being built, uh, when it came to painting and varnishing in mm -hmm. particular, we did have to uh, use this plastic sheeting to try and keep out as <clears throat> much of the dust as possible. Uh, because dust and varnish, as you know, uh, do not mix very, very well. So there was a massive cleaning, um, a cleaning regime every time you you went before you varnished, uh, mopping floors, hoovering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and um, there is uh, practically finished, uh, and um, we still have the. I just want to mention sail making. We did make our own sails. So the sail that's on Drolin, I, I, I stitched quite a bit of it. Uh, don't look too closely at it. You'll see some of the stitching isn't, isn't fantastic, but it's, uh, it was a great experience. And it was a whole week sail making uh, where we made several sails. And uh, we used these sail right machines here on the left hand side with a walking foot, which is <coughs> the most important thing seemingly for sail making that the machine has a walking foot. Um, you ha the bigger the sail, the more ingenuity you had to use uh, in, in uh, getting it through that machine, even though it's quite a robust machine. Uh, and um, the, that's strolling sail there. So I just wanted to show you one other interesting sail, which is uh, you, you, um, I, when I saw this material first, I thought, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to make anything out of this. It won't even hold the stitching. It's a carbon um, fiber sail, and uh, it, it we had to use different techniques to get the the you know to strengthen it and to get the um, strong points. And it was designed for a, a sailing canoe, which actually wasn't wasn't built because there wasn't uh, because of the the break and things that happened. The the guy didn't actually build it, but he has the sail ready to go. This is Jeremy here, uh, our sail maker, uh, pointing to uh, to Graham to stretch it a little tighter. I think for for the for the photograph, um, and um, just uh, this was her board's mouth mast. Uh, um, a lot of work involved in it. Uh, eight sections and it, it uh, glued together and then uh, tightened up with, with um, cable ties. Uh, the black cable ties were really quite useless. Uh, um, the big white ones did a, a lot better job. And um, it took um, four of us two and a half hours to, to do this between assembling, uh, getting it together, 
uh, clamping it with the cable ties, uh, mixing the ordinary epoxy and thickened epoxy and so on. And we also had to leave it in two halves because we had to put in blocking pieces afterwards. So it had to come apart, it had to be taped. Uh, there was, it, it, so whilst it gives you a much lighter mast and uh, it, it, there's a lot of work involved. And both boats, uh, which we referred to earlier, the Flying Ten and the um, Yachting World Day boat stipulate that their masts need to be hollowed out as well. Now, they did it much differently and they had to route it out, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it does give you a much lighter, uh, lighter mast. And we also did the spars that way as well. Um, we did protest a bit to uh, our tutor about that, but he insisted we do them that way. And he was probably right. Uh, the 15 foot boom is, is very, very light. Um, for that reason. And just to, to give you some idea, th this is, uh, I was showing this to Daryl the other night and these are, uh, this is a bit we cut off, off the mast and uh, you can see the way it, uh, I outlined the joints in red and then that's the other end, the blocking piece. Uh, that's a four inch, four inch by four inch uh, mast and uh, a hollow for the main part, except you put in blocking pieces where, where you need to, uh, say, at the breast hook and uh, where uh, the, the gaff is going to be, uh, the boom area, etc., etc., where the stress points will be. Um, so this is the launch. <laughs> uh, on approximately 10 past eight on uh, the morning of the 1st of uh, October. Um, the um, high tide that morning was, was at, at um, 7.30. And Lyme Regis is a tidal harbour. And if you don't get back in uh, within two and a half to three hours of, of high tide, you could be walking a long way and pulling your trailer a long way. Um, so she does row as well. Um, we had a journalist there who wanted to actually see, uh, he, he's going to write a, a piece uh, on her um, and he wants to know if she can row, so she can. She can be rowed quite easily from the rear thwart. We were a little bit uh, wondering about that uh, and she has Rolex, uh, Rolex for the front thwart as well. The problem is the centerboard plate uh, sits down the middle of that when it's up. So uh, it could be a bit uncomfortable, but you could come up with a, a device to, to cover it. Uh, this is her sailing uh, with four people on board, I think. Uh, she allegedly can, can carry five. Uh, we didn't try five that day. Uh, this is uh, the two boats, uh, George O'Brien Kennedy redrafted Drolling and the George O'Brien Kennedy Yachting World Day Boat. And uh, this one I, I just uh, liked to, uh, thought I'd like to show it to you. This is the of a Fox uh, Flying 10. Uh, and this is Peter uh, who worked with us. Um, so I was trying to get the picture for him as well, but she's a beautiful little boat and she, she does fly. Um, um, really, um, I think designed in the 1940s, but uh, a boat well ahead of her time. Um, this is a video. the launch. This is Nigel, the journalist who wanted a sailor to try her out. I, 
I just like to say, because a good few people have given me information, including Michael there, and to our own DB, o, OGA, Mark Sweetman, Cormac Cloud, Daryl Hughes, uh, Boris Fenema, the Commodore of Bray Sailing Club, sent, very kindly sent me uh, a Bray Sailing Club uh, uh, Borgi, which uh, uh, I will use when, when we launch it here, but the weather has been so... Um, uh, diabolical, it hasn't happened. Uh, to Vincent as well, um, who um, is just just said that he has an interest in several boats, but uh, I understand he's he's the waterwag historian. Colin Stroud uh, in uh, the old gaffers uh, uh, in England uh, was helpful in the beginning, and all my friends and and uh, colleagues in the boat building academy. Um, just to name a few people who worked on it, Miriam, James, Peter, Richard, and Joe, in case one or two of them are listening. And we had some fantastic tutors over there, and, and most of them are mentioned and will read the principle. The RTE Contempo Quartet playing the Queen of Connemara at the Clifton Arts Festival 2014. Thank you very much. Could I say thank you very much on behalf of everybody, Michael. That was an excellent talk and a beautiful boat. We look forward to seeing it uh, down at our regatta and pool beg, please God. And I could say that the, uh, the music with the last theme was quite atmospheric. You could visualize ladies and gentlemen in the Alder finery Mm -hmm. out for a, an afternoon sail in a draw lane at the beginning of the 19th century, which I think was uh, unique for the, for the type of boat that it was. So thank you very much for that. Now I'll open it up to everybody for questions and uh, I'm sure Michael will be only too pleased to answer whatever questions you, you have for him. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, Michael, it's, it's Daryl here. If you, if, you had to, if you had to do it all again, what would you do differently? 
the uh, thing I, I suppose I didn't refer to at all, which was a total mystery to me um, initially, was the whole uh, lofting of, of a boat and, uh, and how to interpret plans, uh, how to loft a boat, and then how to... We, we actually built the moulds from our lofting, and uh, between ourselves, we did make mistakes in the lofting, but uh, with a, a keen-eyed uh, tutor, uh, he pointed out those mistakes, and we actually had to adjust one or two of our moulds. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a crucial part of, of building a boat, which I knew little or <coughs> nothing about. And uh, I certainly wouldn't feel uh, uh, totally confident in, the, in that area yet. Uh, but it, it, it is a very important area, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and and better better planning and uh, possibly keeping a diary uh, because you do uh, forget things. You do the first week was just absolute uh, bedlam. If the screen is still open there on the left, I mean it took us ages to get to that stage that you see there with just the bear, as James called it, just the bear toothpick with the tail on it. You know. Mm. 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 Okay. Uh, a question from Michael Reid. Michael, what width were your planks to start with before you start shaping them? Um, they're, they're, they were quite wide, yeah. We, we lost a lot of timber, but I, I can't remember exactly. It depended on what Rob had. And luckily, enough, we didn't have to actually cut the planks ourselves, which was a problem <laughs> as well, which would, would have added considerably to, to, to the hours, you know? I think, we, we, sorry, when we, when we built the first one, yeah, uh, and again with, with, with Frank, I mean the big discussion was we, we started with with a straight plank. Yeah, well we started with a straight plank as well. Yeah. No, but but, yeah. but we, we it was too narrow. And yeah, then, well, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. And then we decided to try and shape it and bend it rather than to have cut it in the correct form initially. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, that was our first learning curve very early on that we needed much wider planks and then to shape them and that left yeah. very a lot less steaming and a lot less trying to twist and pull at the at the planks going on but uh yeah actually, Rob, Rob used to give them to us as wide as he possibly could get you know and uh, yeah we lost a lot of timber though particularly with the earlier planks with the garboards and first and second planks you know sure yeah. sure we, we had to scarf them as well, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, Rob said to me when I ordered the timbers, I said, there's 22 planks. This is our machinist. And he said, ah, but you need more than that. And I says, why? And he says, because you're going to have to scarf every, every, every second one or possibly every one, he says, yeah. which, we, which we did. Michael, uh, if I could just mention about steaming, you mentioned uh, with using the, um, the wallpaper stripper. All of my experience in steaming timber and building boats was with great big iron pipes, yeah, coal lamps and stuff like that. And it was an absolute revelation to find recently when we were replanking the nave crown on an inch and a half of Rocco, just how effective a plastic bag and a couple yeah. of wallpaper strippers was. As I say, it was an absolute revelation. We had no problem bending the stuff at all after an hour. Uh, that, that, that's fantastic that you were able to bend an inch and a half because I we didn't have anything as 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 thick as that, but we were doubtful about it too until we it, it actually works, you know. Yeah. It's a way forward, there's no doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd like to ask a question of both of the Michaels, and that is what do we know about the Ogilvies? <laughs> they, they, they don't really seem to appear in the census at all. No, I I, I did try yeah, to find them, but no, I, I know little or nothing. Unless Carmack knows something. Well, no, I, I just, uh, I have the newspaper archives presently, and I just got the report on the Clunt Harper Cat. Mm -hmm. downloaded it, and I gave a list of the draw lanes uh, that took part. It was the first regatta in which the draw lanes took part. They sailed over from Bray. I think there were six or seven of them. Yeah, I remember, and it gives the names of them and those who sailed them also. But I my recollection that. is that there are three in addition to the original seven. Is that correct? I'm not too sure now about the. Uh, You're just looking at the names. I think there are. The list, yeah. Right. But I, I'll try and delve into that a little further for you. Yeah. Yeah. I can come up with anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know? The only thing I'd say, I, I, and I don't have the the information, but somebody by the name of Oak Oakley came. Well, we were building the first boat and said he was related 
Now, I don't think we were ever able to uh, clarify it, but he, he helped us build the boat for a little while. And there was some something about some connection to the original, uh, one of the original guys who owned it, but we never were able to track it down in the end. He actually rang me, that fellow, and said he was, as, as uh, Paul said there, and uh, I told him where we were, and if he wanted to come out, he did. He did come out and he had a few, but he was adamant that he was actually related. Um, there's a couple of, um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Um, it, there's, a, I have a, a wooden clinkerable boat and um, I had to get new ribs for it. And there's also a couple of um, people in Dorky who have built clinkerable boats, uh, rowing boats. Um, in the Foresters Hall there. Um, and there's also a few other people who have built clinker build boats up around Bal Doyle. Mm -hmm. So it's a pity that there isn't any kind of uh, connection or resources around, uh, you know, what kind of skills are left or what kind of skills are dying out because um, uh, they're, they're fairly gone now. Uh, um, there was a, you know, in terms of who knows who know because uh, as far as I understand, there's no boat building courses in Ireland for these kind of size boats. Mine is a 14 foot, and I had to bring it down to Kerry uh, to get the ribs put in. I had oak ribs made. Uh, this fella in Dawkey, uh, he's a carpenter, and he's built the skiff, the racing clinker built racing skiff as well for for Dawkey and a couple of other places. So there's not many places left in Ireland, but it would be good to see whether it was possible to develop something like that. Um, if I could just mention, Anna, in that connection, uh, there's a water centre in East Wall in Dublin uh, where they have a, a boat building and repairing entity. And uh, the son of one of the last traditional boat builders in Rings End, who was Patsy Wheel and his son, Patsy Jr., is a shipwright in Dublin Port, and he actually gets time off. In the port to instruct on boat building and oh. repairing boats in the East Wall Centre, and they've done quite a lot of work there. They built right. lovely clinker built boats and a Shannon Gandalo also, and they've also mm. repaired some of the racing skiffs and curricks and so forth. Mm. And it's great to see that because it's a total community effort there, and they use the uh, big estuary at Clontarf for the activities. Okay. Uh -huh. If you have any good people uh, with you. It isn't that difficult to put the, the, them no. in because <clears throat> they're not they're easy enough to uh, heat up yeah. and bend and uh, you, you get them out as quick as you can you get somebody to stand in the middle and two people to push them down mm. and it, you clamp yeah. them down and that's the way it is. Well, certainly Kathy McAlevey has just finished her third water wag now in the last couple of weeks. Really? So, I mean, the skills are there. Where is she building it? Uh, this particular one she's building in Athlone. Okay. And uh, there's, we got two water wags built in Bally de Hob. Oh, yeah. In the last two years. <clears throat> uh, so the skills are out there. Yeah. We'll form a club. My, Michael Reed, I would like to congratulate you. It's Boris here from Bray Sailing Club. Uh, hello, Boris. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? We spoke on the phone. We did indeed. Uh, um, thank you for all your help. Uh, no problem. It was a great achievement. And uh, if you're ever with the boat on this side of the East Coast, we'd be more than happy to uh, either see in Dublin Port or in uh, Bray Harbour. So we hope you're more than welcome. We hope to be next year sometime, depending on what next year brings, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But uh, congratulations you, again. Brother. Well done. Thank you very much. much. In, in, rela in relation to uh, Michael hopefully bringing his uh, trolley into the East Coast, Double Bay Old Gaffers always welcome traditional boats to our regatta each year, normally the June bank holiday weekend, and uh, give an open invitation to anybody with a gaff rigged or a traditional boat to keep in touch with us. And as I say, you'd be more than welcome to t take part in our uh, regatta. Just as, I, just as I'd like to point out something we did when we started to sail um, with a couple of the, with the Finnegan boys, um, the jib as such wasn't a jib. Frank thought it might be a jib, but I, I was convinced that it wasn't a jib. It was, you might call it a spinnaker, but just it's, we wouldn't call it much of a spinnaker. 
but that's the way it was. No, it, it would be a traditional, well, I don't know, style spinnaker. Um, but on the plans, though, it is it is uh, called jib stroke spinnaker, you know. And yes, some of the guys in in um, the boat building academy, one who had raced uh, as a junior for Wales, laughed when I showed him these plans and said, "That's not a spinnaker." But anyway, we can have these arguments. Uh, but it, it, it's. The fact that her mast is 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 in catpot style, I suppose, and one foot from her from her stem means that she can't have an ordinary jib anyway. So you you have to put it on a pole basically if you're going to yeah, have something there. I agree. Maybe maybe uh, we can call it a jenniker. A jenniker, yeah. <laughs> okay, no, but the, the 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 logic of that particular sail is that if you're going dead downwind, downwind yeah, yeah. then you've got an awful lot of sail on one side of the boat mm -hmm. and nothing on the other side the to other balance side. it up. So yeah. by putting your spinnaker up when you're on a run, that balances up the pressure on the sails. That's, yeah. the, that's the logic of it. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Vincent. Any it, idea it, oh, how, sorry, how it compares with, uh, you know, in terms of handling stronger winds with a water wag? From the little little I've sailed her, she and it was referred to earlier, I think, by Michael. She she is very very steady boat, uh, but I mean, we didn't sail her in in um, mm. uh, in in uh, different conditions. Really, uh, it was a little choppy on the day, but it, it wasn't really um, bad conditions. And um, she, um, I I would be. Um, <clears throat> Uh, with the spinnaker on, yeah, I, I, I think she could be challenging, yeah, <laughs> to handle. The keel actually is a big problem. Yeah, yeah. If he gets Michael, on. Michael, very quiet Irish cruising club. Uh, Stuart, Stuart, how are you? Thank you very much indeed for that great talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, a vice commodore Irish cruising club, Stuart Spence kindly invited us to listen to your chat i've really appreciated on on behalf of the irish cruising club thank you very much indeed it was very entertaining thank you very much Jerry. yeah and thanks to Stuart as yeah. well michael did you get um i, I think you said you didn't sail her much um, since he got home is that correct you haven't had her out and done haven't had her out at all yeah yeah and have you given her a name no <laughs> <laughs> well, we can give you the names of the old ones. Yeah, they're very interesting names, actually, Vincent. Yeah, yeah, yeah very interesting. Um, uh, short and sweet, I think it'll be, you know. Yeah. yeah. What are the names of the old ones? Well, we had Spalpeen and Bolivar and what else, Vincent? You had a few, and Cormac had a few of them. I had them written down, but I've forgotten them. Okay. It's Balpin Bolivar. Had you a Katie? You had a Katie? Uh, and uh, I can't think of the other ones. I've, I've okay, I, I have a list here anyway. The Spalpin, Tomtit, Scud, Scud 2. Yes. Sounds like a missile, doesn't it? Yes, a missile, yeah. Early Bolivar, days of missile. Bolivar, yeah. Curlew, Dutchman. Yeah. Ohne Kast, which is some kind of German. Yes. Katie and Oozel. Oozel, yeah. Very one, good. two, three, four, five, six. I think that was so seven. That's, so that's nine. That's nine. 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 Okay. And one of them was called Oozel. Oozel with an S. Yeah. Oozel. Oh, with an S. The, the right, right Oozel has, right, right has a Z, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. right. My, my own both called Oozel. That's why I was just. <laughs> <laughs> we called off the usual galley. It's, it is actually. It was, it was given. We, we we bought it just very briefly. We bought it from a guy who used to be the the captain of the usual of the chamber of Uzel or uh, that was in James Street. That's right. And the guy. Yeah. Anyway, so there you go. Downstairs. I didn't, re I didn't realize. I didn't realize one of the one of the drawings was called Uzel. That's fine. Yeah. Listen, Michael, we thank you very, very much. It was very enjoyable. Looking forward to hopefully meeting up and seeing the boat in person after all this thank madness. <laughs> yes, and yeah, uh, I've, I've got a shoot. So uh, 
thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I'll make sure to make a donation. I didn't realize oh, we, right. we should have beforehand, but we'll make sure we can make yeah. a donation at some stage tomorrow, okay? Yeah. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. We, Mr. Weed, uh, are we having a, a club as such, or <laughs> can we have a person to whom we can send information singly, like you, for instance? Yeah, I, I don't mind, but uh, you know, the, the Vincent Delaney, was that you, Vincent, talking? No, it wasn't? That's me no, here, that was, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I, I've got quite interested in the whole history of the thing, yeah, definitely, yeah, you know. And I've, I've got a lot of that. Yeah, and, and Vincent is very interested as well. And Cormac, of course, is always interested in history. Well, Vincent, do you want to be the head of this club? That you have just created. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I would be very happy to receive information, yes. Right. And uh, my email is Delaney, D E L A N Y, Vincent at gmail.com. I haven't got a pencil. So, Delaney without the second E, that's the issue. <laughs> Mike, do we? At gmail. Oh, I see it there, all right. And yes. the Delaney comes first for the email. Mike, Michael Reed, uh, Philip O'Reilly here. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Really, Hello, really Philip. Thank you. And yeah. we look forward to seeing you some stage in Bray. And yeah. thank you for your help, Philip. Also, you're very welcome. Well, Michael, there's another thought that crosses my mind, and that is that we would be happy to hold a a one day regatta in the George, preferably on a Sunday, and to get people to to bring their boats and show them off. And you know, create a, a a media event if that if you could call it that, right. if, if people were keen. Yeah, yeah. And if the COVID has gone away, <laughs> <laughs> and we we could get the guys up from Gal from Galway as well. Yeah, I think it might come. Yeah, yeah. We need to get over the ifs, I suppose, first, uh, Vincent. Yeah. Indeed, indeed, yeah. But yeah, very kind offer. Yes. Yeah. Anybody, any more questions? No, I suppose we could have a clinker built rally. And so it, it <laughs> wouldn't ha have to be just sailing boats, clinker built wooden boats as well, because I think it's something that could be resuscitating in our. Well, there, 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 there's a clinker fest already organized oh. at Loch Ree Yacht Club, which I'm not sure what the date is, but they weren't able to hold it this year as a celebration of 250 years of club yachting on Loch Ree. Okay, thanks. So that could be an opportunity. Mm. When you, when you no, make a plastic there, one. Sorry, there are quite a good few of George O'Brien Kennedy's other clinker built uh, design, the IDRA 14 still in yeah. the mm -hmm. Dark, particularly. And they will be going to clinker fest. Uh -huh. Yeah. Just a uh, last comment from me anyway. Uh, uh, one of the guys on the course was interested in doing a Shannon, a Shannon one because he has a boat on, um, is it Loch Derg? Loch, Loch Derg? Of Derg, yeah. yeah, and uh, but he when he costed it, he thought the uh, overall costs were a bit prohibitive, and he would have, as she's a class boat, he would have had to fly the measurers over twice, I think, and so on. But he he seriously considered it, but it didn't happen. You know, interesting, yeah, yeah. They're about 18 foot, are they, Vincent? They're quite big. They're, they're 18 foot, yeah, with 140 square foot sail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very difficult to build. Yeah. Uh, and realistically, what happens is that they were designed to have a balanced lug rig. All right. In which case, uh, if you got a gust of wind that the that the the bottom end of the gaff would slide forward and depower the mainsail. All ah, right, right. But right. what they ended up doing was that they 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 put the jaws on the bottom of the gaff, which probably increased the power by fifteen percent. 
and then they put on terrilene sales, which mm -hmm. increased the power by 25%. Yeah. Yeah. So the sail is too powerful for the boat. Right. And, and generally speaking, the boats break up after about five years hard racing. Really, yeah. And you have to rebuild them again, put new ribs in right. and new gunnels to, to get them back to square one. There's a very fine video of the building of a Shannon One design on the old RTE uh, program, Hands, which you'll probably mm -hmm. find on YouTube. Right. All right. Uh, with by Jimmy Fury. There, there. And uh, building practically everything nearly by hand with very little mechanical devices. Very, uh, very fine video, though. All right, Vincent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ha having sailed the uh, the boat, I think that the rudder is inadequate. The rudder is too small. Yeah, mm. and the old-fashioned design is not particularly good. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, because uh, a, a lot of small boats have a lot of issues with with rudder design. I know that the waterwag, the the nineteen hundred waterwag, trans rudder was redesigned after the first season as well because mm. there were concerns with it. So well done, Michael. Mm. You did, you did a great, great show tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank well you. Very interesting. Thank you. So I think that's about all, everybody. Um, without further ado, I wish you all a good evening. Mm.